Welcome. Thank you for giving me this, this chance to speak to you. Uh, I've been living down the road in Athens for the last 35 years. I've been teaching philosophy at the University of Georgia. So I've had you know, thousands of students uh, among the brightest anywhere in the world. And I've decided to throw my hat into the political ring. And once I go on unpaid leave, as I'm required to do, which will be in January, I'm going to announce officially my candidacy for Congress in the 10th District. Now, I'm doing it because I feel that our party has not really been putting forward the program that our country deserves and that can excite the electorate to address the abiding problems we face. And we know our Constitution gives us rights as citizens and legal rights. We know that it's taken two centuries of struggle for those rights to no longer be privileges that apply to white men with a certain amount of property, but to extend to all adults. But despite all the achievements of these civil rights struggles, I think we know that not everything is right in America, that people are really struggling to have their ends meet and that we've become the most unequal society in the developed world with the least social mobility. And because we as Democrats have not provided the real solutions to these problems, demagogues like Donald Trump have been able to seduce a certain sector of the population that is struggling. Struggling with jobs, struggling with uh, full-time employment, which is under attack from both outsourcing, from automation, from the rise of freelancing, gig economy, and so forth. And what I want to do is to bring our attention back to these issues of what I'm calling the Social Bill of Rights. And I'm really inspired by what the Democratic Party used to stand for back in the days of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And I'm, I'm inspired in particular by a speech he gave in 1944, his last address to Congress, when he was already in ill health, and he said, look, our Constitution is just not sufficient to be able to give everyone the economic independence and security they need. We need to supplement it with a new Bill of Rights. Now, I'd like to ask you, what do you think would be the right that is most crucial that we have not been given? but that we ought to recognize and enforce. But what do you think it would be? Healthcare. Well, healthcare is important, of course, but, and it is a key right, right? You can't survive and exercise any of your rights unless you get the physical, mental, and one might even add dental care you need. But beyond that, what do you need in order to function, take care of your families, put to say Jobs, exactly, jobs. And the true right to work, it's not the right to work states like Georgia give us, where a public employee like me is not allowed to engage in collective bargaining. Now, by the way, I've, I've joined a, an attempt to unionize all the employees at the University of Georgia. I was told I should never talk about unions in Wilkes County, but I, I, I'm not going to shut up about it. I'll yes, come you can. back to that. In a minute. Okay. There's no employers but, anymore. But, you can talk yeah. about it all you want. But jobs, jobs are key because we can talk about a living wage, we can talk about job training, but if you don't have a job, you're not going to get any of it. And I think we all know that there are plenty of people who don't have a job, not because they're lazy, not because there's anything wrong with them, but because the marketplace does not have a job ready for everyone. And I think we have to put forward the right to a job so that everyone who wants to work is provided with a job. And the only way that can be done is if our government shows it's really for the people by providing jobs when the market does not provide them. And I'm not talking about make work. I'm talking about jobs that will provide goods and services that our community needs that profit-seeking businesses are not providing because they either can't make a profit doing so or don't have the means to do so. Now, I, I think we all know that this is not make work. There are all sorts of 
goods and services we need. Our infrastructure needs to be rebuilt. We need a green infrastructure. If you think about your own county, what do you think the kind of things that should be done that are not being done but which we can put people to work doing? What, for example? What would you want? Those people who are struggling to find work to be able to do. What's that? Training programs? Look, I mean, our schools need assistance, obviously. People need more care at home. People need transportation. People are stuck in, in rural areas. People are in cities. We need to have broadband for all. There's a lot of substandard housing that needs to be repaired and affordable housing to be built. I've heard that in a county like Wilkes County, you can't even hire teachers because there's no affordable housing that their salaries will, will pay for. So there are many things that we can put people to work for, including bringing arts and theater and film to the people who can't afford to go to theaters in larger cities and so forth. Now, this sounds like a big job. Is it possible? Yes. Well, it's possible because we know it was done. When was it done on a mass scale? When? Probably none of us are old enough to have direct experience with it, but we have, we have either parents or grandparents, some of whom benefited from it. The New Deal. Exactly, the New Deal, right? The New Deal with the Works Progress Administration, the Civilian <coughs> Conservation Corps. And just remember, America back then was only a third of what it is today in size. It had 117 million people. It was much poorer than it is today. It had only 6% of the wealth we have today. And it was in its worst economic crisis ever. But still, under FDR, under the Democrats, people were put to work on a mass scale. Eight and a half million people were put to work. Now, this was presented as an emergency measure. But I say we need to make this a fact of life, a perennial fact of life, an ongoing fact of life for a just society. And I think you can, you can see how transformative it would be. Obviously, it will benefit most those people who have suffered the greatest joblessness. Well, we know that African Americans suffer joblessness that's twice as high as white Americans. We can eliminate the unemployment gap by guaranteeing jobs to whoever wants to work. And I know, I mean, I have three young adults, children, um, who are, well, some are in the job market, some are entering it, but you know that young people suffer the greatest unemployment, twice as much as the rest of us. Think of how their lives would change if they know they have a job awaiting for them. Think of people in prison, many of whom got into prison because they couldn't find a legal way of earning a decent living, and now they're coming out of prison in even worse shape regarding employment. But what if they knew they had a job awaiting them? And then think of veterans. I know some of you have been in the military. Imagine how you would feel if you knew that after being sent to defend our freedoms, you don't have to worry about coming back and being unemployed and homeless. You knew you had a job awaiting you. And then the rest of us who maybe worry about being downsized, put on part-time work, we don't have to worry. And this is not bad for business. I want to think of myself as a redeemer of capitalism. Because when you have full employment, when everyone can work, you have the greatest consumer demand. You don't have these ups and downs with different amounts of unemployed, shrinking demand with businesses not having any opportunity to invest, no, we would have the most stable economy possible. Now, what is it that guaranteed jobs does not provide, which still, in a way, infects our communities with poverty? Because you know perfectly well, America is perhaps number one among affluent nations in having hard-working people who are being paid poverty wages. We still have mass poverty, not among just the unemployed, but among workers. Mm -hmm. So we have to think about having a fair wage. And I say a fair wage, not a living wage, because a living wage is really just another way of ensuring a certain level of poverty. A fair wage is a wage which guarantees that we all share in the rising prosperity of a nation. Now, to give you an idea of the difference, from 1945 to 1973, in our country, most workers' salaries rose as the economy grew and prospered. As productivity increased, 
wages increased and the standard of living of most people increased. But in 1973, that came to an end. And what happened was that wages stagnated, but the economy kept on growing. So when that happens, we become more and more unequal because the money is no longer going to everyone who works, it's going to the top. We've become the most unequal nation in the developed world. Our economic growth has shrunk to half of what it used to be. And that shows the lie of trickle-down economics because why has our growth shrunk to half of what it had been when wages rose as the economy grew? It's because all that wealth in the top can't be spent by those who have it. Whereas the rest of us are going to spend much more of our income. So in a sense, if we want a dynamic economy, if we want the whole pie to grow, if we want business to prosper, we need to guarantee that people have a fair wage that doesn't just let them get by and that raises as prices increase, but involves a fair share in our growing prosperity. Now, I'm not talking about $15 an hour. What do you think would be a fair minimum wage? What do you think would be? Okay. Right. Well, I'm suggesting $20 an hour. And the reason I do that is if you go back to 1968, the minimum wage was $1.60. But if you turn that into dollars as they are worth what they're worth today, it becomes $10.50. But if you then adjust that figure for how the economy has grown and productivity has increased, it becomes equivalent to $22. I'm being more modest. I'm saying we should, we should stand for $20 an hour. For a 40 hour week, that's $41,600 a year. What we're talking about here is not increasing the middle class, but getting rid of the lower class, getting rid of poverty wages, bringing everyone up to the level where they can begin to support themselves decently. And it may sound like a lot, especially in a place like Wilkes County or Clark County, where people are still making minimum wages of $7.25 an hour. But the national income of the United States is $18 trillion. There are about no more than 160 million people earning a living. If you divide $18 trillion by 160 million, you come up with $112,000 of income on average per person. That's how much wealth and income there is to distribute. But only 7% of Americans make $100,000 or more. And I'm not one of them, and I suspect many people here are not one of them. So we can bring the floor up. We can destroy poverty wages. These are two important features. Guarantee jobs, having a fair wage, and fighting for a fair wage. I also want to speak about how we need to level the playing field between employer and employee because you need to have a fair say in your workplace. And we can do that by restructuring corporate boards so that 50% of the members are drawn from non-managerial employees. So now workers have a, have, have a say in the decisions that will determine whether jobs are outsourced, how automation enters in, what decisions will be made that affect the whole community. And at the same time, we need to ensure that at every workplace, employees are able to engage in collective bargaining. Now, is there any other problem that still faces us if we have guaranteed jobs, a fair wage, and employee empowerment? What other problems do we all face? Crucial problems that still are not resolved by these measures, which would still allow people to not overcome poverty or the generational poverty past centuries of discrimination have created. Right to help you. Well, healthcare is an important thing, right? You can't do anything. Education is also an important thing. Because if you don't have access to education on a par with others, you have one hand tied behind your back. But I think of something else that's even more pervasive and it particularly bears upon women. I'm talking about the relation of the family to our livelihood. Because for many people, the duties they have in taking care of children and taking care of elders are overwhelming and they prevent them from being able to pursue their career because you can't afford to do both at once. So we've got to ensure that we can both take care of our families 
and be economically independent. And that requires two sets of measures that we as Democrats need to stand for. One is we have to ensure that employers give us the paid time to take care of family matters. We need paid emergency leave, a one-month paid vacation like most other developed nations have. We need nine-month paid parental leave when a newborn comes. That's given by most countries, in, in, in Europe, for example. But then beyond that, we also have to ensure that people can pay for daycare, can afford daycare, can afford elder care. It's just prohibitively expensive for most families. So we should have, as they do in France, a public daycare system where you can bring your, your children to be cared for after hours, just as you can go to a public school. And you need a similar system for elder care. And if we do that, we are really in a position to almost begin ending childhood poverty, but there's one other measure I want to put before you. And that is that we need to have a child allowance. Because you need more money to take care of your family if you have more dependents. So we need to have a child allowance, I would say of at least $500 per child per month. That sounds like a lot of money. It would come to about, there's 74 million children in the United States. If you give each family an additional $6,000 a year per child, that comes to about $440 billion. Now that sounds like a lot, especially when we have a Republican Congress that just passed a, a budget that wants to reduce our revenues by $1.7 trillion by giving tax breaks to the rich. But our rich are sitting on the greatest accumulation of wealth in human history. Private wealth in the United States amounts to over $90 trillion. The top, the richest 1% have as much wealth as the 90 less rich people, 90% have. They're sitting on nearly $40 trillion. You could have a 1% wealth tax on them and it would ensure that no child grows up in poverty. And we need to think about fair taxation. We need to shift the burden of tax onto those who are sitting on these gigantic hordes of wealth that are not being put back into the economy. Now these are keystones to a country that takes care of its people, not putting them on welfare, not putting them on the dole, but giving them the chance to be independent, to be able to earn a living and take care of their family and have a chance to participate in politics. I have other measures regarding how we can get money out of the legal system and all have a fair shot at legal representation. I would have more to say on education, on health care. I'd be happy to answer your questions. All of these measures are realistic. They've been done in other countries or in this country. They can be paid for. We have everything we need except the political will. So I hope you will join me in making history and bringing that political will into being. And I will be going out speaking on these matters at greater length uh, in the months to come. So I, I hope you will look up, see what I'm up to. You can look on my card for various ways of seeing what my views are on various YouTube videos, on my website. And when I become an official candidate, uh, then I'll be putting this out in a, let's say, a more, uh, let's say, professional way or, or <laughs> proper way. But any questions or comments? OK, well, thank you very much. And by the way, you asked about health care. I will say that I do favor Medicare for all, but not the Medicare that I have as a senior citizen. Because I know, as, as some of you of my age know, that Medicare does not cover everything. It has co-pays and deductibles that not everyone can afford. So we need a super Medicare for all with no co-pays, no deductibles, that covers all physical, mental, dental care. And we can pay for it with a highly graduated wealth tax. But, yeah. Oh, yes, and let me introduce my, my wife, <laughs> Sujana. I don't want to forget her. About time. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and she eloped to join me in Athens and has been working as a lawyer since, first doing employment law and employment now immigration law. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. 
What do you say about the health care form, the, the tax form just been passed through the House? No. What do you have to say about that? Do you think it will make it through the Senate? Well, uh, I mean, I hope not, certainly. I hope not. I hope not. I hope some of the senators will show some scruples because it's very much something designed to enrich those who have taken over our government, both to enrich themselves and empower the rich. It depends on whether it's voted on before December 12th or not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, hopefully we are at the beginnings of a political tsunami of which the 2018 elections can be the first step. And then on to 2020, when a lot of these policies that the Trump administration is trying to put forward can be reversed. But that depends on us and what we do. Somebody had brought up education. I don't know if there's time to address that. Okay. I mean, I know a lot of political candidates, for example, Bernie Sanders, when he spoke about education and making education accessible to people, mainly spoke about higher education and spoke about making sure that uh, the state state universities should be have free tuition and the technical college should have uh, free tuition. Uh, I once wrote an op-ed piece to the Atlanta Constitution criticizing the Hope Scholarship. As many people think of the Hope Scholarship as something providing free tuition. But what I was objecting to was the Hope Scholarship relies on the poor man's stock market. It uses the money that people who are not well-to-do haven't gone to college in most cases. They're less likely to send their kids to college. Mm -hmm. They are paying for a fund that's going to support a much more affluent sector of the population. And that's not how it should be funded. If we're going to talk about free higher education, my mother went to Hunter College in New York City, mm -hmm. which was completely free. And she could not have gone to college if it wasn't free. Well, we do need free public higher education. We also have to give living stipends to students. Because if you're poor, you can't go to college even if you have free tuition. You've got to support yourself. So we have to have stipends. But we also have to think about the education that all of our young people go to. And remember that most people in America do not go to college. And we have to think about how can we really support elementary and secondary school education. I think one of the, the biggest problems we face, as you know, here in Wilts County, is that the funding for school districts varies from county to county, from district to district, based upon how wealthy their real estate is. <laughs> well, we've got to end that inequity. We have to ensure that students everywhere in the country that is much support and resources, no matter what zip code they live in. And well, look, I've been an educator all my working life. We need to realize the importance of educators, teachers in elementary and secondary schools. They need to be paid accordingly, and we need to also require them to get further training. They need to become more expert in their field of, 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 of teaching. But to do that, they have to be rewarded, as they should be. So we need to have more money in public education. We have to ensure that students go every day to a gym class, that every day they have an art class or a music class, and also that they study philosophy in at least two years, <laughs> in, in, uh, in at least high school. Because if we're going to be citizens who can really think about justice, think about truth, we need to engage in philosophizing, and not dumb down our public curriculum, not mm -hmm. make it all a matter of teaching for the test. And these are things that I think we need to do. Basically, being a good citizen by learning critical thinking skills. Exactly. I mean, whether you go to college or whether you go to trade, you've got to be able to discern between truth and bullshit that you read online. <laughs> <laughs> and we all, we all should study the great classics of political philosophy and ethics. Mm -hmm. It can be done. You know, why should we de be depriving our young people and everyone else of these great achievements of human civilization? So I think there's a lot we can do in public education if we have the will and if we're willing to fund it. And we should do that as Democrats and as citizens. And one uh, topic that's close to my heart is legal representation. I know Richard has a lot to say about that because a lot of my clients are unable if I don't give them discounts. Um, 
to uh, bring lawsuits. I mean, when I used to do employment discrimination law, I worked in a firm actually that did not charge any fees and they only took a portion of uh, any winnings uh, that the uh, client got. So we were doing employment discrimination, race, gender, sexual harassment, and people were able to come um, and get our services without paying. But that is a very unusual. We were the only law firm in the entire Southeast that was doing that, but most people want money up front. And that's why a lot of rights do not get redressed, violation of rights, because people don't have the money. So I think that we should have a plan for I mean, my address something I don't think anyone else has put forward. I'm calling it legal care for all. On the model of a Medicare for all, where you have a single payer legal insurance that will cover all criminal and civil legal representation. So you can go to any lawyer you want, not just for criminal cases, but civil cases. And civil cases, I think as we all know, are just as important, right? If you, if you, if you want to sue someone for discriminating against you, for harassing you, if you have family conflicts that need to go to court, if you have any damages or injuries that have been connected to crime or, or, or other situations, you need to be able to get legal representation. And if we want to free our legal system from inequality due to how much wealth we have, then we have to ensure that people have access to lawyers, the best lawyers, no matter how much money they have, not only for criminal representation, but civil representation. And this can be done. This can be done on the model of a single payer health system. So this, I think, would be How would this be funded? Well, we, I think the fairest way to fund this and every other measure is to rely on a taxation system of both income and wealth that is highly graduated, where we tap into the those who are most wealthy, who can who are most benefited from the system, and whose lives will be most unchanged by contributing to the welfare of everyone. So I think wealth tax is one side of it, and not raising income taxes on the majority of the population, but raising it on the very high echelons, as it once was. For example, under Dwight D. Eisenhower, the tax rates under a Republican were over 90% for income tax for those who were making a you know, million dollars a month. Since Ronald Reagan, all the tax rates on the rich have been drastically lowered. And government services have either had to be paid for by the rest of the population or through sales taxes and municipal taxes, which then fall you know, most upon people who are not as well. So I think that's how we want to think about a fair taxation system. And I think this is good for business, because as with healthcare, there's no reason for businesses to have to pay for these services. These can be paid by highly graduated income and wealth taxes. And you don't want your health benefits attached to a job, because not everyone has a job with benefits. You lose your job, you move from job to job. You want to have these benefits no matter whether you have a job or not or where you're working or whatever your job history is. And I say that should, should, should be true also of, of something like Social Security. Yeah. I don't want to be the optimistic weasel yeah. of the bunch here. Yeah. If you could grab one of these ideals, yeah. let's say if you get elected for the 10th, yeah. yeah. which one of them, because I'm going to be realistic, all of them just ain't going to come at yeah. one time, but if you could get yeah. two, let's just say two of them, yeah. What be what your first yeah. two that you think would be most important to hear from Wilkes County? Yeah. Wilkes yeah. County, yeah. Um, education, yeah. job training, yeah. Yeah. and housing. Yeah. Yeah. That that would yeah. be very uh, uh, good for our community. Well, one thing about training, job training, and education, it's not going to help you if you don't have a job. And if you don't have a job and a job at a fair wage you're not going to be able to pay for housing. So I, I think the key points I would want to put before you, the voters, and put before you also because they're really not being advocated mm -hmm. elsewhere, is a job guarantee, a federal job guarantee, where our government will ensure that anyone who wants a job will get a job, serving <coughs> the public good. And then 
to have a national minimum fair wage that goes up as our prosperity rises. Not just the living wage. I think if you have those two things, you have sort of the foundation for eliminating poverty and eliminating all the historical disadvantages of inflicted minorities and everyone in general. Essentially, you're saying in the abstract that all employees should be getting dividends uh, based upon earnings of the economy. They should all share prorata. And you could say that. I mean, I mean, but you can also think of it as just um, you know the the minimum income would, would rise as the wealth of the nation rises, and in that way, we can have a, a rising standard of living to the extent that our national wealth increases, that everyone will share. And I think we want to get rid of, of any kind of bottom below a middle class where people are stuck in poverty. That's a social crime. That's something wrong. And we should not just talk about the middle class. Forget the middle class. You know, the middle class is an artificial construct. There's no, there's no objective way of saying where it begins and where it ends. But we don't want a lower class, a bottom class. We want everyone to be able to have opportunity, to be able to support themselves, and be able to lead their lives, and take up whatever opportunities they want to engage in, irrespective of how much wealth they have. And we can do it. We can become great in the sense of being the most just nation in human history. We have everything we need. It's up for us to, to attempt to make that history. I think there are definite answers. They're feasible. They can be paid for. We are the richest nation in human history. And we're also, perhaps, the most hardworking nation. We certainly are in terms of the hours we work, largely because a lot of people have to work more than one or two jobs. And you know that they're here. So the human talent is here. The wealth is here. It's a question of political wills and all the things that are preventing our political will from being well, expressed and exercised. That's why I want to start everything in January. We need to fix what we need to fix here in Lewis County so that we'll be ready. And I do want to read the comment that the attorney from the Democratic Party, Michael uh, Jabalinski, I think I was pronouncing it right. But the questions he was asking, he was like, we need more specifics. Who's counting ballots? Who has been questioning voters? What are the questions? Being Wilkes County, I would believe anything. We have a very bad reputation when it comes to voter fraud. We need to fix that. And so those are the two issues that we're going to focus on in January. 